one three six. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation for our hospital, which is represented by Nicolas de Conning. My name is Paolo Simoni. I'm a radiologist at uh, uh, Children's Hospital in Brussels. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce my colleague, uh, Nicolas de Conning, which is a Belgian neurologist uh, specializing in pediatric neurology with a particular focus in the field of neuromuscular diseases. He leads the Neuromuscular Reference Center in Pediatric University Hospital, Queen Fabio. Uh, here in Brussels, Belgium, with more than 100 children who are regularly attending a multidisciplinary consultation. And also, he, he works also at the University Hospital in Ghent, where he's uh, responsible for the clinical trials for neuromuscular disorder. And he has been a principal investigator in a large number of clinical trials with a main focus on the spinal muscular atrophy called 6RD, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and he uh, uh, had his uh, PhD thesis focused on the evaluation of new gene therapy approaches in the mice model for the dystrophy of muscular dystrophy of Duchenne. And uh, he authored uh, or co authored a large number of publications on the field of neuromuscular disorders and recently a major uh, publication on, on SMA describing new breaking through therapeutic approaches for this disease. And uh, I'll, I'm now very happy to pass on to Nicola to start. So thank you, Paolo, for this uh, nice introduction and uh, good evening to everyone. Very happy to be with you to share. Um, I would say probably with you as a public, more my, my the interplay between my the clinical expertise and, and uh, specifically focus on, on neuromuscular disorders and what you can uh, learn from uh, uh, imaging techniques. So these are my disclosures. Of course, um, yes, when you talk about imaging neuromuscular disorders, you of course mainly have to talk about uh, MRI. You all know about that. Um, and uh, of course, why? Because definition of small muscle is better than with other techniques. Um, you can obtain views from several views. Yes, axial coronal sagittal images can be obtained. It's now fully possible to obtain old body images uh, that can be you know, obtained quickly, that are really important. We, uh, you will see when you have to consider some pattern recognition. Of course, no irradiation and um, several sequences that allow to study the different uh, features of the muscle. Of course, generally speaking, when you talk about muscle disorders, you have to, to and, and, and you will see that in children, we often talk about genetic diseases there is a muscle pathology that evolves and very often it starts with the occurrence of uh, necrotic cells and that are also often surrounded by inflammation as you can see on this histopathic picture and then progressively there are some waves uh, of necrosis regeneration in the muscle again in, in chronic diseases and of progressively with time uh, the normal tissue will be replaced by fibrous and fatty infiltration and uh, if you correlate that with the uh, MRI technique, I would say that these are the sequences that are mostly can be used to um, uh, better identify some of the processes. So typically the T2 sequence and the steer will be fine to uh, look specifically at some necrotic aspects and, and inflammation. So a kind of acute phase of the disease. And also I, 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 won't, I won't talk about that, but T2 mapping and spectroscopy as, as though a T1 and uh, also the three-point Dixon technique can be very used or typically used to identify, identify the fatty infiltration progression. So uh, why do we use uh, MRI to study neuromuscular disorders in, in children? Already a long time ago, uh, you know, we were um, I, I often, I'm specialized in looking at uh, analyzing muscle biopsy and Nowadays, you know that uh, we, we need the help of, of the radiologist to, to guide our biopsy. Also, and I would, that, would, that will be the main focus of my talk, uh, it's to identify some patterns of muscle involvement that are very, <clears throat> I think, useful for the diagnosis because it will be a lot about genetics nowadays. But I think uh, um, in, in, the, yeah, in the diagnosis process, uh, MRI is, is often very standard and helps in, in many cases. Um, and also, we, now, we are also at the era of uh, new treatments, and uh, we tend to look at sometimes in some patients uh, 
as uh, the progression of the disease. And, and my MRI could is is already, for example, in Duchenne, a good biomarker for progression and can be an outcome measure in clinical trials. As, as you can see here, for example, you have, um, yeah, of course, MRI will uh, differentiate healthy and pathological muscle. Uh, as I told, if you look at this MRI, looking specifically when uh, where uh, the active uh, disease is present, you may, of course, guide your uh, biopsy here in the posterior segments of, of the thighs here. Just to give you uh, an example, uh, or you should be guided because, for example, if you consider this patient, uh, here you have a, a muscle on, on the left side, the quadriceps, the vast, vastus lateralis, which is fully uh, uh, um, tra tra uh, where fat uh, has, uh, has been introduced in all muscle. And of course, you perform the muscle biopsy. Uh, at this muscle, often the muscle biopsy won't be very informative as if you go and perform it on here, the, the vastus lateralis is on, on the right side of this patient. Probably you may have, you have more, more uh, typical histopathologically that has the characteristic, characteristic features of the disease you want to, to look at for, and uh, it will help you uh, definitely in the, making the diagnosis. So um, just to, to give you uh, an example, starting from clinics, I show you the story of a, of a male, 18 years old, suffering from what we call the Lyme girdle weakness, so in shoulders, uh, um, also in the lower, uh, the proximal uh, lower limbs with some weakness. It seems to be uh, in the X-linked inheritance. And so you see the, the hypertrophic calves and there is a typical quadriceps weakness. And so you, you should suspect uh, in this case, Becker muscular dystrophy. On the other way, you have uh, a female, uh, almost same age, also suffering from Lyme girdle weakness, with a sporadic case, uh, but she has noticeably some uh, skin symptoms with hyperkeratose and pilaris. And um, you see also these typical retractions in the fingers um, that are, you will see typical from what we call Bethlehem myopathy. Of, of course, sorry for that, but we will talk about generally some really rare diseases. And uh, of course, in, in, in my field, there's it's a kind of collection of rare diseases, but some of them will, are more frequent. So um, how can, if we now consider the, the, the images of, of this uh, patient, you see that um, some clinical phenotypes can be very similar, but the fat infiltration is, is not random. And uh, you, so it, I, I think that with the same uh, kind of thumb, kind of same phenotype, Sometimes uh, imaging can really help us in trying to, to get to the right diagnosis. For example, here you have a typical posterior uh, infiltration that is more prominent. And in this case, it's really the vastus lateralis that are affected with a relative sparing of the rictus femoris. How can we quantify, of course, uh, fatty infiltration? You will see at, at the end of my presentation that, of course, you should tend to use more and more automatized uh, uh, methods. But uh, in the clinics, in, in the day-to-day, -day, we still use what we call the mercury score. Happy to discuss that, which is a semi-quantitative score. Of course, observer-dependent, but quite often uh, easy to, to, to apply, where um, a score going from zero to four, uh, zero being normal, as you can see here in, in the, the, the gracilis muscle. Uh, for example, one being fat infiltration of less than 30%, as can be seen in the adductor, um, two um, in the vastus lateralis, and three uh, with a code of uh, in fat infiltration that is uh, that is overpassing 60% 60, 60 of the surface of the of the muscle. So you can quantify each of the muscle, and uh, of course, um, when you start to to read the muscle biopsy, you should of course study the anatomy. You should quantify the fat infiltration and try to identify. Uh, a pattern, but most of that you you already probably more, know more better than uh, myself. So we also use all body MRI, uh, which is not a technical issue uh, at this moment. Uh, give you provide information regarding cranial, scapular, arms, and, and trunk muscles. Um, the more uh, information we have, the better for the diagnosis. Uh, but however. Uh, if we look at the numerous different, different genetic uh, 
manifestation, there are still not many reports describing patterns of muscle involvement in, 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 moment in the whole body. Algorithms, they, they're still focusing uh, in findings in the lower limbs typically. So here to show you an, an image of, of a patient we had, uh, an 18 year uh, old boy that was showing, uh, as you see, can see here on, on this um, coronal section. He was presenting uh, uh, in the gluteus a fatty infiltration that if you look closely is already often very present under the fascia. Um, also in the vastus lateralis, again, also in the gastrocnemius, uh, again, in the paravetral vertebral muscle. It's, it's kind of pattern, which is uh, this under the fascia infiltration is typical for some kind of collagen six related disorders. So what do we have to look? It's, um, uh, we would consider general versus patch infiltration. Very important in neuromuscular disorder is, uh, do we talk about symmetrical uh, versus asymmetrical involvement? Is there a gradient of infiltration? Um, more some more general features, do we talk about a congenital disorder or do we talk about a muscle dystrophy? Also very key if you use uh, old bodies to look at tongue, subscapularis sub muscle and also abdominal muscle that will can give you important clues to get the diagnosis. But now um, I, I, tend, I try to make you a short introduction, but here coming back to more, what, what is my, my, my field where, where as pediatric neurologist, I, I start with the patients. Um, and I here present you on this slide, the most common neuromuscular disorders and how they are grouped. Um, uh, just to mention that we had the, the chance to, to describe them in, in a recent book that was published uh, with my colleague, Nathalie Gumans in, in Leuven. Uh, in at Mackey's Press that describes uh, the, the diagnosis, or you should diagnose the, the neuromuscular in children, but also all, all the aspect of multidisciplinary management, which is very important, and also the, 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 the era of first treatment, mainly in, in SMA. So when we talk about uh, muscle, I, I won't have the time to go to all the, the, the muscle disease, but a major group is the group of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, that would come on top, on, on it's the most frequent one. Then you also uh, have the frequent, it's, it's of course not a muscle disease, but it's a motor neuronal disease, spinal muscle atrophy, SMA. Um, and then of course, we also have many patients that suffer charcot maritus, where I would say probably imaging is probably less important. They have a, also a, a clear pattern of distal weakness uh, uh, that is typical. Um, and then you have the Lyme girdle dystrophies the, and also very important congenital myopathies, but also FSHD, uh, fasciocapular humeral dystrophy, which is uh, an autosomal dominant disease. When you, you, when you see the, the pattern, you, you probably with the high good eye, you recognize this patient, but sometimes you can be really helped by uh, imaging to, to, to make the diagnosis. I would talk to you, I guess I would say a few words about metabolic myopathies and the most common one is pumper disease. Um, this is a, it's a mutation in alpha, alpha glucose, glucose does. Um, and, um, and then inflammatory myopathies. I think um, uh, if I understand, some of you are familiar with, uh, very familiar with inflammatory myopathies that of course exist in children. So let's start with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, it typically happens in, in boys. It's an X-linked disease where you can see the, the typical uh, phenotype of the patient presenting with hyperlordosis, a calf hypertrophy. So that, that, that goes with the retractions in the ankles. And so it does the impact that the, the children, the boys tend to, to work on the tip of the tooth. And then there is a progressive um, tie uh, and proximal weakness that appears. Uh, in gluteus muscle, but also in vastus lateralis, in quadriceps, um, that will evolve over the time. The disease is caused by a mutation in what we call the dystrophin gene, uh, and dystrophin is typically a protein that is being uh, expressed at the underneath of the sarcolemma in the muscle, so it's absent in the ear under in, in the muscle biopsy of a, of a Duchenne patient with some revertent fiber, but it's fully absent. This is a normal biopsy. 
And if you look at more uh, uh, typical techniques, you will see, of course, some waves of necrosis and regeneration that happen in, in, in the muscle. And of course, with the time, that will lead to the deposition of uh, fibrotic tissue. Uh, a, a typical uh, marker of Duchenne dystrophy is the Gower sign for clinicians. So uh, it really illustrates the, the weakness uh, of uh, the thighs and, and the, uh, the psoas, uh, uh, gluteus muscle, but also uh, the paravertebral muscle or uh, on the lower side of the back. Uh, and so you, you see that when children have to, 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 to get up from uh, the soil, they, they, they typically tend to use the hands to push on the ties and to project their trunk vertically, and which is uh, typical of, of, uh, of a muscle disease. You can also can uh, see here the, the hypertrophic calves that are also typical of, of the disease. As I mentioned, you can see here uh, on this cartoon, the representation of the dystrophy gene just under the membrane of the, the sarcoloma. So we see here the the internal part of, of the cell. And if actually the, the, the absence of dystrophin, which you can see here on this biopsy, leads actually to a kind of, um, leads to more uh, possibility of damages in the membrane. So it's like, like the, <clears throat> the membrane is less uh, strong during the contraction. The disease has a um, very progressive impact on muscle, on multiple organ systems. So we typically do the, the diagnosis at approximately the age of five years when physical ability begins to, to diverge from healthy children. And then children, they tend to lose ambulation at uh, the age of 10 years, and they require often wheelchair from, from the early uh, teens. And then the, the muscle, the disease still progresses with respiratory and uh, uh, insufficiency, the, the, the often development of orthopedic complications like scoliosis, and then heart failure, and typically death between the age of uh, 20 and 25. So if we now look at the pattern of MRI, what will appear uh, first in, um, in the, the disease is the, the position of, of uh, um, fat, fat infiltration into the gluteus maximus, but also minus, minor, that will be clear, uh, that will often precede the infiltration in uh, the thigh muscle, uh, but then with the time, um, you will see on, on this T1, um, yeah, the deposition, but which, which is more diffuse into the avastus lateralis, but also in the uh, adductus mag mag magnor. So what we also typically see is the, the spare, that the gracilis and the sartorius muscle are spared in, in the disease. Um, and then um, here, uh, an illustration in steer that shows you uh, more uh, a kind of acute uh, appearance of the disease in, in the in the in the uh, semi uh, semi membranous muscle here. So uh, with the time, there will be uh, an worse, uh, worsening of the infiltration in the quadriceps, um, often with a, as I said a spared and hypertrophic like a compensatory mechanism of gracilis uh, muscle. You can see on, on, on this picture on the top uh, left. Um, but the muscle, there is, there is myodem up, up, happening with the time. Also, typically in the calf, which are often hypertrophic. And, and initially, they are hypertrophic, not, not, not just because of fatty infiltration, but because of uh, overactive multiplication of, of muscle cell as a compensation mechanism. Uh, but you will see a slight infiltration of the triceps that, that, that will start. And uh, here you can see some myoedema in the, 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 the triceps surrealis and in the fibular muscles. So uh, of course, with the time, of course, the pattern will be less specific and there will be uh, overall fatty deposition in uh, uh, all the muscle of the thighs and that are of course correlated with the evolution of, of the disease with still remarkably a kind of sparing of again, gracilis and uh, sartorius muscle. Um, I would say that if you look at the pattern of progression, it starts with uh, typically gluteus medius, gluteus minor. Also, they have, uh, um, I would say that if you look closely, gluteus minor is, is often firstly affected if you compare to gluteus major, then also piriform muscle. Then, of, all, of course, the lesions and fat infiltration in adductor magnus, quadriceps, and long head of biceps femoris. Um, and more, 
tendency of the sartorius and semitendinous muscle to be spared. If you look to leg, uh, I would say that solus uh, and gastrocnemius and peroneal muscle are affected more than the deep posterior and uh, TA, uh, uh, posterior tibialis and the anterior tibialis that are more spared uh, initially. Um, of course, if you follow the patient uh, with trying to correlate muscle strength uh, in the quadriceps, for example, or in the anterior tibialis, there is of course a correlation between the strength and what we call the, the, the contracted cross-sectional uh, area, which is of course the when you can calculate by subtracting the, the muscle surface and you subtract the fat uh, surface and then you, you get yeah, an idea of the contracted cross-sectional area. And also, uh, for example, there is you can find some correlation between the mercury score, so the, the percentage of fatty infiltration, with also muscle strength, uh, some correlation, but are not so nice, I would say, here. So uh, techniques to, to, to make this correlation are, have been uh, improved, and I, I, we, we may discuss that at the end of, of the talk. So now, give you, as an introduction, now, this uh, huge list of uh, the, the world of Lyme girdle dystrophy. So Lyme girdle, it means like having um, uh, yeah, weakness in, in the thighs and in the shoulders. Uh, also with typically patients showing uh, scapular winging. Uh, but with the time uh, and the help of genetics, there have been many of these diseases that have been characterized with mutation in genes, with different patterns of uh, um, genetic inheritance some being autosomal recessive, other ones being autosomal dominant. And I show you just a list of them. The most frequent one would be calpinopathies, dysferlinopathies, alpha sarcoglican, gamma sarcoglican, theta sarcoglican. These are, uh, you will see some protein that are associated with what, what we call the dystrophin com complex. Um, and this disease typically appear uh, more during the adolescence, uh, or they sometimes may mimic also Duchenne muscular dystrophy, so appearing more earlier at the age of well, between five and, and six year old. So here, just to show you a, a few uh, pictures of the patient. So here, um, typically a patient presenting a calpine three deficiency. So with a typical, uh, very strong scapular winging. So uh, subscapular deficiency. Um, the LMNA, so the slamine, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a protein that is expressed in the nucleus of muscle cells that leads, uh, of which the mutation leads also to this uh, teenager with really amyotrophic, again, lower doses. It's not so obvious, the calf hypertrophy is not so obvious here, but you also, you see some striking uh, contractures that appear quite quickly, also in, in the shoulders with the time. And here, this teenage girl, she has a, what we call a fucutin related protein uh, it's also um, uh, yeah, proximal disease. So just to, to give you a kind of overview of what could be the, the genes and, and the proteins that are involved in this disease. So the first most important and most frequent one is dystrophin. So this huge protein that is present under the membrane of a muscle uh, of the sarcolemma, of the muscle of the membrane of the, the muscle cell. And then here we are in the, the cytosol space where we see uh, the typical myofibrils of actin and myosin. And you see that there are many proteins that have been also, uh, that are attached, that are combined in, in, a, in a huge um, protein uh, structure, which, which we call the, the dystrophin associated complex. Some of them crossing the, the membrane. We call them the sarcoglican here on top, the dystroglican, uh, uh, merosin also, laminin. So these molecules, the mutations are associated with what we call congenital muscular dystrophy. So very severe, very early onset severe muscle disease. Uh, I was mentioning you the LMNA here, which, which is a protein in the, situated in the, in the nucleus membrane and uh, also calpine, which is, uh, uh, for example, a um, protease. So um, uh, how to recognize fatty infiltration pattern in lime girdle muscle dystrophy? There's, typically no involvement of cranial muscles, very important. There is often a huge paraspinal muscle infiltration, uh, as in Duchenne, Sartorius and Garcilisis are not involved, and also tibial posterior is usually not, not, not involved. Uh, 
as you can see here, uh, uh, so, some, some examples uh, of very paraspinal fatty infiltration, which is quite important. If you look at masseters, terigoigus, if you consider closely all the, 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 the facial muscle, uh, mastication muscle, you don't see, of, you don't have any infiltration often, and the ear, the sparing of gracilis and sartorius muscle. Um, here I show you the muscle, the muscle MRI of, uh, of this girl that was involved in one series we, we could participate in. These are several patients where you see the progression uh, of the disease, but you see that first in fucutin related protein, you have a the predominance in the posterior segment. So in the, uh, the with affection of the, uh, uh, the biceps femoris, semi tendis and semi membranous muscle. And that of course it's never pure, but with the time, uh, this typical pattern disappears with of course all muscle being affected over time. Uh, I would say if you try to, if you, you have to make a guess in front of a kind of similar pattern, for example, there will, the, the affection will be more predominant in the anterior thighs in, in patients with dystrophin mutations like in Duchenne or Becker, also in Lyme girdle dystrophin being affected by dysferlin and anosine. These are quite more frequent genes at the origin of Lyme girdle dystrophies. If you look at FKRP, so the, the girl I just showed you and calpine three, you will have a predominancy of the posterior thighs. Um, um, here, a few examples that I, I tried to show you. So this is a typical pattern of, of a dystrophic, of a X-link disorder, the, the Duchenne uh, spectrum, some uh, where you see a, a kind of very important fatty infiltration. The, the dysferlin here, where you see a, see a sparing of the posterior, um, and also a typical pattern of the what we call the sarcoglycan uh, disease. Pumper disease is, the, uh, is a, a glycogen storage disease. So uh, a second group, uh, uh, which we, we call sometimes not so easy to, to, to well understand the, diff the difference, but we talk here about congenital muscular dystrophy. So these are muscle disease that appear earlier, sometimes in the neonatal periods with some some uh, children having uh, hypotonia, but sometimes they nevertheless can achieve walking without too much problems. But I mean that typically the, the, the symptoms are already present during uh, infancy, early infancy, uh, sometimes stabilizing. Um, there are again many of these congenital muscular dystrophies, but here I just want to draw your attention for, to what we call the, the collagen six related disorder. So collagen six is one of the multiple collagen that we have in our body, but it's specifically um, uh, expressed um, at, the, uh, at the basal membrane of, of muscle cells, uh, and also in, in some, uh, uh, yes, in, many in muscle, but also in, in the, under the skin, in the dermis. Uh, and what is typically striking, they have also, as many of these muscle patients, they have uh, a proximal uh, uh, weakness with the hyperlordus, but they also have a typical uh, hyperlaxity of the fingers, which is quite striking. And here, very, and, and here we, we call this pattern a Bethlehem disease because Bethlehem is quite mild. Children are mildly affected, although they present the symptoms from uh, early onset. They also have often some keloids on, on the skin. It's a kind of overproduction of, of the scar uh, because of this, uh, yeah, this dominant effective effect of, of collagen six. And here at the, uh, Another hand of the spectrum, also collagen six disorder, but with, that was initially described in very severe children with that we call Ulrich patients. And here you can see that there, there are many, many striking contractures in this disease, uh, very um, amyotrophic children. And also, although you have proximal contractures, there is also an hyperlaxity of, of the distal uh, uh, in the fingers. Uh, there is a, a typical muscle uh, pattern that you can be you can identify uh, in this patient. We will see that more closely in uh, in the next cartoon. Um, what you can see if you perform uh, in this patient a skin biopsy, you will see that uh, here you see that the the, 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 the the appearance of collagen six that that's here not under the membrane but at the outer space of of the sarcolemma, so in the extracellular space, 
in this UCMD uh, patients. And of course, uh, the secretion of collagen 6, you can appreciate also in fibroblast sculptures, is uh, very often very disturbed. So, um, what is, is really, uh, if you, what is very striking in this uh, disease is that you have the fatty deposition under the fascia. So like you have this, uh, so here you can consider the vastus lateralis, and you see that fat is depositing really under the fascia uh, and like surrounding, uh, yeah, uh, like a line, a fat line under the fascia that surrounds the, the remaining muscle. Also rectus femoris, uh, there is a typical also some fatty deposition in the median fascia of the rectus femoris. Um, you can see it also in the triceps suralis, uh, sorry. Um, also in the deltoids, and how you have this kind of um, uh, plummet appearance in the deltoids again because fatty deposition under the fascia uh, in the triceps suralis that are mainly affected. Also in the gluteus magnus muscle uh, that is very striking on, on the coronal section uh, on the whole body scan. Another disease is uh, what we call uh, fascial scapular hemorrhoidal dystrophy. It's, easy to recognize when it's present in the family. Uh, what is striking is uh, it's a disease initially caused, uh, the mutation is to be found on chromosome four, as you can see on the top uh, right here. Uh, what is happening, it's, it's a region, it's a region 4QA, it's a region where there is actually no, no typical genes that are being produced there. Uh, these are repeated uh, regions. Uh, um, uh, typically, a normal patient, a normal uh, normal human, has of more than ten of to two hundred or two twenty of these repeats. But in the disease, in the region, there is there have been there these uh, regions, these repeats have disappeared. They they were mutated, and so there is a contraction. We call that a contraction of the number of repetitions, and because of that we see that the, the level of um, methylation of the region has diminished. It means that some genes that are there, and we talk about Dux4 gene, uh, can be now trans trans translated because Dux gene is present in this region, but because of the hypermethylation, it's not expressed, which is not anymore the case in FSHD. And so Dux4 is a kind of toxic gene that normally is expressed during um, uh, development. And, um, but uh, during adult life it, it, or uh, in early childhood, it needs to be repressed. And that's not the case uh, in this patient. So uh, the, it's the overexpression of Dux5, it's four, it, it, that is toxic for the muscle. And this leads to this, yeah, this muscle um, atrophy, again, typically striking with scapula alata, typically also the trapezius muscle that are very weak and also the humeral region. So triceps and biceps that are very uh, weak. Also, typically, a weakness of pectoral muscle. Uh, and also, I, I don't have to forget that uh, because you see that that was in, in COVID times. So it's not so obvious to see the, the face of the child here. But there is a, a striking asymmetrical uh, facial weakness also. So it's a very peculiar uh, pattern, uh, uh, which is asymmetric, uh, affecting pectoris muscle, humeral, the humeral region, and also the face. And uh, if you look at the, the MRI, you will see that uh, in patient, there is also often lower uh, involvement, but which is quite asymmetric. Uh, you can see it here, uh, it's quite striking here in the, the posterior compartment of, of the leg. Uh, it's quite different from one leg to another. There is an important scapular involvement here. You can see here the, the fatty deposition, again, very asymmetric. Um, also in the paraspinal muscle, um, and also importantly in the abdominal muscle that are often quite uh, uh, early uh, affected. And the, I would say that you, if, when you see a fatty deposition in abdominal muscle, you always have to also make the, di the different diagnosis with pompa disease, uh, which is also, which could also appear a, a bit at the same age, like, like in, uh, in infants um, yeah, from uh, 10, 10 years old. Um, 
We then have the group of congenital myopathies. Um, again, a very huge list of, of genes. So these are more genes that are involved in, in the contractile uh, aspect of the muscle. So mutation will lead to, it's not a kind of evolving disease. It's like from birth, uh, the contractile apparatus of the cell is not working uh, properly. So for example, you have mutation what in, in alpha actin, so in tropomyosin. So these are the, the key proteins of, of the contraction. And of course, if you have mutations that are still viable, uh, this patient will appear as very weak from uh, birth with very apotonic, very, um, um, uh, with um, um, atrophic muscle, but they will nevertheless, some of them will die quite early, but nevertheless, the, the surviving ones will, will develop, acquire work, but, uh, and, and they will have a progress that you would not expect uh, from, from birth. Um, of, of course, before the era of imaging, we were performing um, uh, muscle biopsy and all these congenital muscular dystrophies that have been uh, characterized through the appearance of the muscle biopsy. So you can see here that there are uh, typically uh, cells that have variation in the widths. So it's, it's, these are not regular cells, which is a hallmark of a problem in the muscle biopsy. Uh, and you see, can see that there are many central nuclei here. Uh, so it's a central nuclei, um, nuclei uh, myopathy, because usually in, in a mature cell, uh, nuclei have to be at the surrounding of, uh, of the, the cell. Uh, so it's a, that's a central nuclear disorder. Here, uh, what you see is kind of, there is kind of fiber grouping. Uh, it's a, uh, what we call a, a myopathy of congenital fiber disproportion. And here you see some at electronic microscopy, you see some rods. Uh, so, um, that these are nemaline myopathy. So all kinds of uh, congenital myopathies uh, with always some peculiar fe features. Uh, and for example, here, it's one of the genes, the rhinodine gene. Rhinodine gene is, is a molecule that is also in the, uh, on the membrane. So prop, uh, at the proximity of what we call the T-tubules, the T-tubules are the regions of where the membrane is, is invaginating and it conducts the, um, the, uh, the action potential, and it's involved in the transduction of the action potential to the, the contracture, so, the, so to the, the appearance of calcium in the muscle cell, uh, and this, the, this transduction, transduction of the signal goes through the high energy uh, receptor, so AHI1, which, which is not an uncommon uh, disease, and uh, you see typically um, yeah, uh, a major involvement of uh, glitures major, and again, uh, a, a sparing here of the rectus femoris, rectus femoris muscle, which is quite common in uh, congenital myopathies. So again, this cartoon show you, you, uh, you, you first probably have to concentrate your the look at, at these three uh, patients, I would say from 10 to, to, to 15 years old, very atrophic, uh, with scapular winging, uh, 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 symptoms that were present from, from real birth, but they could acquire sort of walking possibilities. Uh, and if you look at them, you, you have to guess about the diagnosis, it's really difficult. And each of these children, they bear a, another kind of mutation. One, one is in the selenoprotein gene, one is the, in the hyaluronidin gene, another one is in the danamine 2. And I don't have really the time to go, in, or to go into all the details, but if you look closely, there are really different patterns of involvement. What I can say is that in the ties, you often have a, a very, the, the sparing of the rectus femoris, which is quite striking. But for example, here in dynamine two, you have uh, some, the semitendous muscle is affected, which is not the case in the other disease. Uh, for example, in the high, the HIR1 myopathy, the tibialis posterior is, uh, sorry, 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 the, the solace muscle is uh, quite affected here, just to give you an example here. Uh, here, um, a disease which we are getting out of genetics here. So uh, this little girl came to the consultation uh, with the development of a purple appearance on, on, on the cheeks and on the, the highlights, also on the dorsal part of, of the, the, the distal parts of the fingers, as you can see here. Um, and, and also here with, with a squamous aspect also. Uh, we performed, of course, a, a blood uh, examination, a blood sample measuring the CK that were elevated. And uh, yeah, from the clinical aspect, you also can see 
the appearance of uh, uh, this redness uh, on on the on the elbows on the knees and sometimes in that's from another patient some cal calcium some subcutaneous calcium deposits and you usually make the diagnosis of dermatopolymyositis. Sometimes uh, there are some, uh, for some children, the, 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 the skin features are not so obvious. They, they have a kind of acute uh, weakness appearing with the time, high CK, and then you can be helped uh, by uh, MRI. Uh, this picture shows you uh, a kind of, um, um, uh, kind of muscle edema that is present uh, subcutaneously in, in this patient. You can see also some uh, dystrophic calcification here in the gluteus muscle. Um, and you also have on the steer um, sequence, you can, have the, you can see the presence of myoedema, of inflammation in some parts of, of the muscle, and it's really patchy. Here you are talking about babies here. Um, it, it's a, a young boy, two months old. Um, he has a really good eye contact, very striking. But if you look closely and uh, if you are a bit used, you will see that he never presents any uh, anti-gravity uh, anti um, uh, movements. So you will see that the legs, they will never go, go up, which is fully abnormal if you just observe the, the child for, for a certain time. Uh, he, he, he can cry, but the, 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 the level of cry is not so, so important. And also you, you, st you start to see what we call a, a paradoxical uh, respiration. So it means that when he, he gets to inspiration, you have a, a actually the abdomen that is going up. We call that paradoxical respiration. Uh, and um, it, it's, this is the typical picture of a SMA type one patient. So spinal muscle atrophy. And, um, and we see many of these patients, uh, and as uh, it, uh, there has been some attention for this disease recently because there have been new therapeutic options that, that have been developed. Uh, SMA has several uh, clinical pictures. It's a, it's a really spectrum. Most often, you have the SMA type point patients, which are who are very severe patients uh, that will at least uh, uh, die. Uh, the, the onset of the disease will appear uh, from the age of two months. They will never achieve a sitting position, and they usually life is it's not possible uh, uh, at older age than two years, at least without any, uh, for example, respiratory support. You have then the SMA type two, which is the intermediate form, which starts typically between the age of seven to eighteen months. This patient can sit, but they will never be able to to stand. And uh, of course, yes, these are the patients that we see in, the, in our neuromuscular uh, multidisciplinary consultation. They will have. Uh, they will develop severe scoliosis, also some uh, ventilatory uh, difficulties. For example, needing often not invasive ventilation. And then the SMA type three, also called Kuckelberg-Willander, starting later than the age of two, uh, eighteen months. And these children, they be they will be able to to stand to walk. So sometimes achieving walk a bit uh, late. But you will see again this appearance of this typical proximal weakness. Huh? So you would say, okay, that could be a kind of congenital muscular dystrophy, for example, uh, or congenital myopathy, but it, it's actually a, a spinal muscular atrophy of, of type 3. If you, as a neurologist, which, which I, I am, if you take the, you, you elicit the reflexes, you, you will see that they are fully, uh, you cannot elicit any uh, reflexes we, we call, we talk about areflexia, which is typical of, of a motor neuronal disorder. Uh, the disease is caused in, in mutation of in the SMN1 gene, uh, which is present uh, on the chromosome 5. And um, yes, of course, uh, it's typically a mutation in exon 7. It's a homozygous mutation that, uh, that will lead to the absence of production of any uh, SMN, which is the protein, which is normally produced by SMN1 gene. We call it SMN, survival motor neuron protein, which is really important for the survival of uh, motor neurons. Um, uh, of course, with the, with the mutation, so in the absence of the exon 7, you, you, the, it, the production of SMN is, is not possible, sometimes a bit compensated by SMN2, but I don't have the time to, to, to go into the details of that. Um, what, what is the impact of that? It's, uh, of course, uh, SMN being pro produced in any tissues of the bodies, but it has really an impact on the survival of motor neurons. 
and of course um, the lack uh, there will be a severe apoptosis of the motor neurons and that will be uh, the, that will lead to de degeneration and so of course degeneration of the motor neuron will lead to a severe atrophy of the muscle um, and that's that's the origin of spinal muscle atrophy it's not a, a muscle disease it's really the degeneration of muscle disease of the motor neuron that leads to the atrophic muscle so and the atrophy happens we tended to use some muscle biopsy but not anymore uh, today in these days but you see that the atrophy is uh, scattered uh, sorry is grouped uh, in in some part of the muscle biopsy so it's because the denervation it's it's one motor neuron that has denervated and this motor neuron was responsible for for the innervation of this part of the muscle biopsy but there there is still a, a, a motor neuron innervating the, the the muscle cell so when it's denervated, there is immediate atrophic, the, uh, and the development of atrophic cells. Uh, I will talk mainly about SMA type 3, uh, which you can see again, you can see this Gower sign that I tried to show you. So it's, it's not specific about Duchenne, it's really the, the sign of, of a proximal uh, weakness. And you see these children, they have to use some uh, uh, accommodating mode of. Uh, um, um, uh, yeah. extra mobility tools to uh, to uh, being able to deambulate um, and extremely bright children uh, often. So if you perform a, a muscle uh, MRI, again, there will be, with the time, there is an evolution of the disease. And uh, you will see that if you take a patient with one year duration, you will see almost uh, normal muscle here, I would say, uh, Con concentrating here um, the images on, on the uh, on the gluteus muscle. Here it's the upper limb. You see the bicep, the triceps. You can see what is striking is often a first uh, fatty deposition in the iliopsoas muscle. Uh, so this is striking. Uh, some subtle changing in the gluteus maximus that you can see here after 10 years of evolution uh, of the disease. Uh, and then also first happening in the triceps muscle uh, before the biceps muscle. But of course, with the time, uh, all muscle are being affected in the, in the pelvis with a certain sparing of uh, uh, biceps muscle. This has been reproduced in, in several uh, studies. And yeah, there is the kind of, of a pattern appearing here uh, that may help you to different uh, the disease, disease from uh, other kinds of muscular dystrophies, for example. Um, just to draw your attention on, on when you, you perform a, a whole body uh, scan, uh, if you see some fatty disposition in the tongue, you have to think about specific, specific neuromuscular disorders, some involving adults also in the list here. So pumper disease, uh, some mitochondrial disorders, I didn't have the time to, to mention that, some forms of congenital myasthenia and some congenital muscular dis disorders. And also, of course, ALS, which is a also, there is, which has a, a very frequent uh, bulbar component. Uh, if you look at the scapular muscles here, you have to talk, you have to think about uh, FSH to Lyme girdle dystrophies. I, I mentioned you the calpine 3, but also the sarcoglican muscle, also a kind of Lyme girdle dystroph dystrophy, and pumper disease. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then if you think about abdominal muscle again, the FSH and then pompa disease here, you can see. Yeah, you can see here that the weakness of the abdominal muscle, which is typical in pompa disease. Um, yeah, I, I, of course, there are some, I, I will skip this one. Um, in neurogenetic disorders, you often have what we call patchy involvement. Uh, here is a kind of specific uh, particular form of SMA, which is uh, where another um, protein involved in, in um, the, cell, the, the cellular transport in axons is affected. Um, you also, if in, in Charcot-Marie disease, you have also a kind of often infiltration gradient because it's again, it's, a, it's the nerve that, that, that leads to atrophy, atrophy, atrophy of the muscle cells. And also in vasculitis, you also often have um, um, asymmetrical uh, disorder. So just to provide you also uh, an example, or you can use pattern in, try in trying to identify, identify new genes. Uh, 
So we recently, with uh, one of the PhD students I'm, I'm following, we identified in a group of patients, initially two of our patients, then, then we, we submitted these, these cases to uh, other teams, and then we could find that the patient were again showing this particular fatty deposition, which is quite striking in all these uh, patients. Um, and you can see similarly, um, but also in the lower legs, in some of the, uh, on the TA, for example. Uh, and then, of course, uh, a, a very deep genetic diseases uh, um, were, were performed in this patient without finding uh, any uh, mutation in the known genes. And then finally, by regrouping them, uh, by all the exome sequencing, we found some uh, uh, variants into a new gene, what we call the YAK2 gene. And uh, actually, you could see that, yeah, there is a common denominator to all these uh, patients because the, 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 sometimes the clinical appearance is, is quite different, uh, but there is a common uh, denominator to, to, to this uh, that you can uh, see uh, on the several MRI scans from these patients. Uh, also, uh, we can also sometimes use uh, muscle MRI to uh, identify some uh, a muscle uh, phenotype in, in disease that have uh, that have uh, who present themselves as a broader syndrome, like some patient presenting some mental retardation, some cerebellar uh, atrophy. So it, these are ataxic patients. Uh, and of course, they have uh, developmental delay, and these are the striking uh, features. But with the time, they develop uh, uh, um, muscle disease, also kind of with a kind of lamb girdle pattern. And you can see that there are some um, fatty infiltration uh, appearing in the thigh muscles in these patients. Um, so I don't know if I still have some, some time, but. Uh, uh, a few, a few uh, thoughts now on what do we need to describe the pattern. Of course, we need some data from several patients from different uh, genders, uh, from different families with different mutation and in different clinical situations. Um, and then we can try to define some algorithms and there are several teams in the field that have developed so, some algorithms to, to try to uh, yeah, identify a specific pattern for a specific uh, uh, gene uh, being affected in specific muscle disease. Um, and for example, uh, I don't have the time, but uh, in, in function of some involvement of some muscle that you have, that you find on the MRI, you can try to, to, to through, the, uh, through the algorithm, to try to uh, exclude or include some, some of these myopathies. Uh, it, does, it exists, for example, for some uh, adult forms of myopathies, which are called uh, myofibrillar myopathies. It's all about pattern recognition. And um, there are, however, few disorders that have really a specific pattern. Um, and there are several disorders in which single cases or small cohorts have been reported only. Um, also few series describing features of patient early or in late, uh, late in their progression. Uh, and not so many natural history studies. Um, in which patients have been studied repeatedly through the years. We need collaboration for that. Um, just to, to provide you some, I think that um, if you combine, of course, um, muscle MRI quantification and also with some symptoms uh, through a specific diagnosis, you can try to, to, to use some automatized techniques and, and use the, the the, 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 yeah, the technology of artificial intelligence, and you can uh, use some uh, cluster analysis, and you can try to, to, to build some pa uh, automatized patterns, uh, recognition patterns. Um, and of course, the future is about machine learning. Uh, and then I will finish my talk. Um, saying that, that muscle MRI can be useful for the diagnosis of patients with muscle disorders in children. Uh, of course, we still need more data on larger cohorts. Um, yeah, it's, it requires specialized teams really to, to recognize the, the, these patterns. And I think that the future will be helped by informatic tools. Thank you for your, your attention and very happy to, to discuss uh, uh, with you if you have some questions. <laughs>
thank you so much. This was a, a spectacular talk. I think it's very, it's very, it might be surprising to us how powerful the pattern approach uh, really is if you have a, a, a overview and a cohort like you do, right? So how, how do you think radiologists uh, should describe these patterns? So I have seen very sophisticated scoring techniques, which we basically go through every muscle group and, you know, score muscle edema, atrophy, fat infiltration, and give it a score which I now think, you know, could paint the pattern if you put it in a database, but how, how do you work with your radiologists and what is your suggestions on how to report uh, the, the, the patterns, which seem to be rather complex and, and fine at some, at, for some diseases? Yeah, so I, I think um, what I've, so I, I would say, for example, with, with Spalo, we, we are working on that, but it's, what, what we sometimes miss is, is probably um, also, as I, I mentioned, to have, um, you need a very collaborative work. It's true, but for example, in, for example we, we, we tend to follow, for example, if you talk about congenital myopathies, we, we see, for example, 50 to 15 to 20 of them in our consultation with different gene mutations. So it, it means a low number of patients. So it's really about uh, collaborating with other teams. And of course, being really uh, able to, to, to implement the same set of, the uh, to, 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 to same way of analyzing uh, the, the muscle images. So uh, that's, that's really, I think the key, the key issue now, the, um, the yeah, the, the, the main concern now in the field. So uh, we, I, I tend, I, I, as pediatric technologists really inter interested in the field, I have several collaboration, of course, so with some in Europe, um, and we tend to, to, to try to yeah, evaluate with the same techniques. And then, of course, very important, you have to uh, normalize uh, through age, uh, sex, and, and eventually try to also correlate that with um, uh, some um, functional evaluation. Because then, of course, as, as I could show you, when you have a disease in a very advanced stage, it's, you don't recognize anymore any pattern. So, uh, um, I think if you want to establish a pattern, you need to be quite sure that you are talking about a kind of same gene mutation, seeing the patient at almost the same age, and then, um, and then, yeah, and then you, you, you can normalize your observation. Yeah. Because it, I have to admit that sometimes it, it still remains kind of at the level of, of some case reports when you, you have some teams collaborating, be collaboration between three or four teams. They, they can they can describe a, a specific pattern, but then when you generalize, sometimes it, it, it's not so often um, um, I would say um, confirmed. So, but in, in but on the other side, on the more common disease like uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, no, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, no, we we get really an important uh, expertise that has been built now. Great. I have one question from the audience, which I'll, I'll just read to you. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Are there di diagnostic dilemmas and decision points where imaging makes a significant contribution in the initial workup, or does everything depend on biopsy and clinical features? So uh, I would say that um, we tend to perform less and less muscle biopsy mm -hmm. at the time because it's invasive. So uh, and and we we of course use the combination of uh, you you know that. Uh, yeah, new next generation sequencing is is, is becoming standard in, in uh, I, I, I don't know in the US, uh, but in many, many European countries, it's you have access, patients have access to that, it's reimbursed. So, and when we find some, um, when we find some specific um, variation in some, in, in some genes that may be uh, at the origin of, of the disease, then it's really important to uh, control that, to, to correlate that, uh, with the muscle images, uh, because what is happening with next, next generation sequencing is that you you all, all often come to many variants, and so it, in the report you receive from the geneticists, you there could be some many muscle disease actually. So before you know, in the 90s we were just just chasing one 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 gene after each other, um, and uh, but now we we receive at once very uh, huge number of information about uh, several genes where there are some vari uh, variants. Some of them could, they could be pathogenic. 
but then you to, to make the choice uh, you, uh, image imaging is it brings important uh, cues clues for that that's great yeah i have a follow-up question for that so uh, you, you mentioned um dixon mri so uh, if you know if um if you go to a conference like uh, that's MRI heavy, like the ISMRM International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, there seems there's a huge interest in uh, muscular MRI, and there seems to be a huge emphasis on quantitative imaging, which uh, probably goes from anywhere from semi-quantitative techniques like fat fraction with you know simple Dixon technique to really sophisticated MR spectroscopy. Uh, and you know quantitative T two uh, decays and all that. So where where do you where do you see does this fit in? Is this pure research or is there uh, is there one technique or another that's closer to being used in clinical practice or being useful to you for for managing diagnosing or treating patients? Uh, I would say that what what is more um, where, where does the the technique were uh, were very useful is in the design of, of you, you know that in Duchenne muscular dystrophy there are now some uh, uh, therapies that have been developed gene therapies like we are talking about you know the gene of dystrophin like a micro micro dystrophin form of, of the gene that is incorporated into a virus that you can inject to the patient and the the, the protocols are using um, MRI follow up as a secondary objective. So, uh, and in, in, in many of them, they use the Dixon technique because the Dixon technique is, is a thing that can be used in many centers because of course, of sometimes you have some teams really specialized in that, that can use the T2 map uh, uh, or um, also using uh, spectroscopy, but often in the context of a clinical trial, uh, all the centers uh, uh, do not specifically, again, use the same uh, patterns of the same uh, sequences. And then, um, and so you cannot, all, you almost or not always use hyper-specialized uh, techniques, but I've seen some uh, Dixon techniques that have been uh, applied across huge therapeutic trials across uh, mm -hmm. multi-center. Okay. Um, we have another question from the audience. Uh, uh, so Dr. Mini is curious, uh, if, is, the, is there a reason for the relative sparing of the sartorius and gracilis muscles in DMD uh, and limb girdle muscle dystrophy, et cetera? Yeah, that's, that's uh, if you're of course interested in, in the diseases, in, in the physiopathology, it's a, it's a really a good question because uh, um, what, what we know is that about uh, dystrophy is that um, it stabilizes the membranes. Um, and um, during contraction, and it could be that uh, some muscle are more uh, um, confronted to what we call eccentric contractions. And eccentric contraction, they, they, they may lead to huge, uh, very often damages in, in, in isolated cells. And it's really the accumulation of, of uh, this damage that will lead to the progressive disappearance of the muscle cell and then the appearance of fatty filtration. And it could be that some muscles are less uh, confronted to, to this kind of eccentric contraction. But that's just, just one hypothesis. That's more a kind of mechanic hypothesis. But there are, of course, more also metabolic ones. But uh, no one has the answer up to now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Paolo, do you have any questions? Uh, I do have a question for our radiologists because your first question is, was the, the, the focal point for most of us, how to report and uh, the, clinical, um, the clinical features are very clear, but for, for us, uh, we've got different devices, we have got different uh, uh, standard protocols and what is, uh, even if even if we are a web of and uh, and very uh, and very continuous connection between us, for us it's very difficult to have, for example, very standardized technique for quantitative uh, for quantitative assessment of the muscle. I don't know what is the web, the relations, or the uh, organization to have a standardized protocol in the United States, because even in, in Europe, even between center, we are, we are not far away from one each other. 
we got different different techniques used. For example, even in the Dixon techniques, we have two points, six points, depending on the strength of the of the field. Uh, have you got a special society organization or initiative to uh, make this process more uniform to compare your data, especially when it comes to segmentation or quantification of the of the muscles? I don't know if in Europe and United States we have to do two different policy or uh, connection. So in, in, maybe I can have start now with the answer, but um, in Europe, um, there's been some European funding um, on teams that are really, I uh, would say, specialized center, European specialized center in, in the diagnosis of, of muscle, of muscle disease. So the story starts from specialized centers in, in the diagnosis of muscle disease. And then they have developed some initiatives like Mayo NMR, and um, Amayo MRI, for example, under the leading, the leading, the leadership of uh, uh, a physician called um, Volker Straub, for example, at Newcastle. So, but I think these initiatives they remain uh, quite isolated. Um, if, if if I I don't know your world, but if you compare to the whole world of, of uh, musculoskeletal radiologists. Yeah, and uh, I do have another second and final question for my part. Um, we uh, compared in this, uh, we, we have the chance to compare in this particular presentation, the genes and the genetics, which is the future, but also the advanced MR. And uh, at this stage, my impression, but it's probably just an impression, the genetics analysis and the MR analysis are uh, contemporary, uh, is there there is there a trend to schedule the genetic analysis between the MRI or as I imagine the MRI to uh, narrow the uh, the 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 number of pathology of the genes to uh, to to examine? Uh, and yeah. is this for you uh, cost effective? To how cost effective is to perform the MRI? to have a, a narrow spectrum of genes to explore. Is this the reality or is just the radiology impression? Yeah. So of course, you, you first have to compare the cost of the genetic analysis and the MRI. That could vary from country to country. Um, but I would say that you know, in Belgium, at least, um, MRI is still easy uh, and the access is quite e easy. Um, of, of course, you need to, to be able to, to, to work with some very trained radiologists, of course, huh? because it's not the case in uh, every team. I mean, in terms of, of, of pattern recognition, I just, just uh, as I mentioned. Um, but uh, then I think you should do it in parallel, in, in, in my thinking, because then um, they, they won't, there are very few very specific muscle patterns. For me, for me myself, the most, most specific is the collagen 6. Pattern that I showed to you, um, uh, but uh, there are definitely some atlases, some books that define some specific patterns. And then we, when you come back with the genetic analysis, uh, again, as I mentioned, you you receive, for example, some variant in, in this gene, gene A, and gene B, and some gene C. Then having the muscle uh, MRI, you can really then um, um, uh, conclude on, on which specific gene is affected. So that, that's that's the way I, I see it. So it's a kind of combination. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's the, the, the way I see it. Because um, it, it's remained rare that you really make a, a full uh, genetic diagnosis on the basis of, of a muscle MRI. Thank you. Thank you for, for, me, for my part. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, Paolo. Bye.